It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce this year's commencement speaker, Dr. Ro Roxanne Gay. <laughs> Dr. Roxanne Gay is a writer, a critic, a professor, an editor, and a social commentator writing across multiple genres and forms. Her books include short story collections, Aiti, and Difficult Women, the novel An Untamed State, the best-selling essay collection Bad Feminist, and Hunger, a memoir. Dr. Gay has written four and edited several anthologies, is a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times, and the primary writer for the Marvel comic book series World of Wakanda. She has won both an Eisner Award and a Guggenheim Fellowship, is the writer and editor of The Audacity, an e-newsletter on Substack, and is currently developing several book, television, and film projects. In addition to her printed work, Dr. Gay hosts a podcast, The Roxanne Gay Agenda, in which she discusses topics like feminism, sexuality, race, culture, politics, and food with an array of guests. She had held faculty appointments at Purdue, Yale, and Florida Atlantic universities, and she is currently the inaugural presidential professor at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roxanne Gay. Hello, graduates. It is a real pleasure to be here at the School of Visual Arts and your graduation ceremony. I want to thank David Rhodes, the Vice President Anthony Rhodes, and Provost Christopher Cyphers for inviting me to join you today. First of all, I want to congratulate all of you. It is quite an achievement to get through four or five or six years of college. And to do so during a pandemic has taken grace and patience and a lot of fortitude, and so I commend you for that. You are here with your friends and your families and your loved ones and perhaps an enemy or two, and they have all been at your side as you have pursued your graduation, uh, your education here. Normally, with a commencement speech, you give some sort of uplifting and inspirational advice, and I think that's important, but I think there is also a lot going on in the world. At the 2022 Freeze New York Art Show, there is an incredible installation created by the art collective How to Perform an Abortion. It's called Trigger Planting. It features a large map of the United States over which there is a living herb garden of the plants that can induce an abortion. The plants are strategically placed across 26 states, and when you look at it, you realize just how many people in this country are on the verge of losing one of their most essential human rights. Adjacent to the map is a list of those 26 states with trigger bans, near total bans on abortion, fetal heartbeat or six-week laws, and constitutional amendments that would prevent any protections for a person's right to get an abortion. These artists see what's coming, they see what's happening, and they are responding with power. I posted some images of this installation on Instagram and a woman responded, places where I would never live, yay. I thought about that comment for hours. I'm still thinking about it. She was being pithy and perhaps honest. I'm sure she thought her comment was harmless. Many of us who live in states where women's lives and bodily autonomy are valued probably know that no matter what the Supreme Court ultimately decides, we're gonna be safe we're gonna have the inalienable rights that we deserve. But at what cost? And with politicians threatening a federal ban on abortion, banning birth control, banning IVF, and more, for how long do we have those rights? And what other rights are they coming for? Marriage equality, gender-affirming health care, all of the social progress we have fought so hard for over the past several decades? Pundits like to call debates about these issues these issues that shape the course of our lives, culture wars, as if who we are, who we love, how we hope to live in peace 
are merely matters of, well, choice. In a sense, I suppose we are at war because those of us who are marginalized are constantly fighting for our lives. So despite all of this, a woman said yay because she feels free and safe, which is what we all want for ourselves, our loved ones, our communities. What stunned me about that woman's comments was how she was only concerned with herself. She was safe, so yay. There was no care for or consideration of the millions upon millions of people living in those 26 trigger states who are not safe who are being told that their only option if dealing with an unwanted pregnancy or medical complications or pregnancy as the product of rape or incest is forced birth. Lives are at stake, futures are at stake, and it's crystal clear that some lives in this country are seen as disposable or irrelevant. Today we are holding a commencement. This is a celebration. It's both an ending and a beginning. And you may wonder what the politics of abortion has to do with this significant moment in your lives. What I'm trying to talk to you about is the importance of seeing. Lately, when I go online to read the news or browse social media, I feel like we are teetering on the verge of dystopia, this kind of nightmarish future that we tend to see in science fiction novels and bad movies. Only the state of the world is not fiction. The confluence of crises that we are facing is very real. I see that. We are still dealing with a pandemic that has ended the lives of a million Americans and many millions more around the world. And now there's monkeypox on the horizon, which wow, just the name alone, don't want it, no thank you. The planet is getting warmer and warmer. Fascism is spreading across the country and around the world, and some people have decided that maybe democracy is a little too inconvenient for their ambitions. Gun violence is out of control. Mass shootings are a daily occurrence. Most elections seem to go to the candidates with the most money. Gerrymandering disenfranchises millions of voters every year. There is a literal shortage of baby formula that has parents panicking about starving babies. There are other supply chain issues affecting everything from the produce we eat to car production to book publishing. People without generational wealth have very little access to home buying or saving for retirement. But sometimes, I wonder if we treat a dystopic feature as inevitable when a great deal of our collective future is still in our control, no matter how powerless we may feel. I have never been someone who traffics in hope because I am a pathological realist, and too many cultural conversations treat hope as the only way forward. It's this ephemeral thing that we pin all of our hopes on. We hope people are inherently good. We hope change is possible. We hope that the world will become a better place for all of us. We hope someone is coming to save us. Unfortunately, we rarely spend much, if any, time thinking about who is going to do the work of making our hopes reality. But I also don't traffic in despair, or at least I try not to. Like I said, I'm a realist, and so I try to see the world as clearly as I can. I also know that when we succumb to despair, we assume that the worst outcomes are inevitable, that there is nothing we can do to alter the course of our future. But this is not true. One thing I have learned over the course of my life is that change is possible if we are willing to see the possibilities. When I'm feeling too overwhelmed by all of this terrible news, I honestly just want to look away. I want to believe that maybe I'm catastrophizing and I need to stop doom scrolling, that I'm absorbing news from a distorted reality. So I take a breath. I step away from the screen. I pay attention to what I can see, things that I know to be true. The problems our world is facing are indeed overwhelming, but they are not the whole of our world. I said I was trying to talk to you about the importance of seeing, and part of that importance is seeing the whole of the world, the painful realities as well as the beautiful ones. And there is so much beauty in my life. My parents laughing across from my wife and I at the dinner table and knowing what a gift it is to spend so much valuable time with them. Our dog Max, who knows nothing of current events, who is only interested in literally constant attention, chirping chicken, menacing our cats, and having his head rubbed 24 hours a day. 
I see theater that makes me laugh or cry or challenges my understanding of everything. I see remarkable visual art, sometimes confounding art. I see how people engage with that art. The best parts of life are so inexpressibly glorious. Here's a little story. Also at Freeze, I saw two sculptures by Swedish artist Kaja von Zeipel called Post Me, Post You, and Celesbian Terrain. The former is what can best be described as an orgy. Four women, two with cameras strapped to their heads, all four bodies contorted in complex angles of pleasure. A few feet away against a white wall, a girl with eyes wide open, braids stretching from her head in different directions. The piece is startling and provocative, erotic and disconcerting. It's a reminder of what art should be, something that is compelling and challenging and original. And between these two sculptures, as we were looking at them, there were these two guys having a full-on photo shoot as they enjoyed the fair. One young man had a camera taking photos and his friend was on the ground in, let's just say, a salacious position, his leopard print thong peeking out from the waistband of his jeans, which is to say that he dressed for the occasion. It was a charming reminder that there is so much worth seeing if your eyes are open, if you are willing to look, and if you are willing to be open to everything that you see. I say all of this to explain that I see this world clearly for what it is and what it could be, for better and for worse. I see how things do seem to be falling apart and how people find ways to thrive nonetheless. You are artists. Your art is grounded in how you see the world and how you express that seeing in your creative work. And we need your work. We need your articulations of how you understand the world now more than ever. As you move forward into the next stage of your life, I want you to see clearly both the challenges we're facing and the potential of an unknown future. Nurture your powerful imaginations and believe that this world can become the better place that so many of us yearn for. Believe anything is possible for yourself because despair is a luxury we cannot afford. See a future that is more abundant and equitable for as many people as possible. Do not look away from the problems of the world, but never believe that the world is nothing more than its problems. See the strange, remarkable beauty of everything around you. See the people in your lives and nurture those relationships. Take care with yourself. See a future where you can make the art you are most called to make. See a world where art matters, because I assure you it does. Again, now more than ever. Instead of leaving you with advice, I'm going to offer you a challenge. What world do you see? And what world do you want to see? What are you willing to do to bridge the distance between those two worlds? Our future is not known. It is yours to create. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gay. Your remarks are certainly cause for hope.